I would firstly like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, water, and culture. I am currently on the land of the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. I further acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which you are on and pay respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Welcome staff, students, entrepreneurs, innovators, and everyone else watching to the 2021 Sydney Innovation Festival. This festival is designed to introduce the university community to innovation opportunities and the entrepreneurial mindsets of thought leaders from both inside and outside the University of Sydney. My name is Nick Stevens, and I'm the MC for today's program. Today's session is the finale in the Sydney Innovation Festival, and it asks what appears to be a simple question. What is a startup and why should Australia make more? As you are following along with the panel, if you have a question, please post it in the Q&A session of the chat. If you see a question you like, give it a thumbs up. We'll be answering these questions at the end of the session. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Director of Innovation at the University of Sydney, Dr. Martin Tomic, to open the final session. Thank you very much, Nick. I'm joining from my home office, which is also on Gadigal land, and I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and the critical role in caring for country. Being home to one of the world's oldest civilizations, Australia has a long and rich history of innovation. And one thing that is becoming increasingly clearer about the nature of innovation is the role of interdisciplinarity. It doesn't matter if you study or work in business, engineering, medicine, or music, innovation has greatly impacted all of these industries. And innovation often emerges from bringing disciplines and the knowledge together. For the university to thrive in this field, it is essential that we promote diversity, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary learning, and also collaboration. And this is a key objective of the Sydney Innovation Festival. So with this, it is my great pleasure to welcome everyone to the third and final day of the 2021 Sydney Innovation Festival. Thank you to Olympic athlete Melissa Wu for sharing her experience with founding businesses and what she sees as the key skill for innovation in the opening video. And thank you to all of you for tuning in to today's panel discussion. You will hear from some of Australia's top thought leaders and innovators, and I would like to sincerely thank all our speakers for volunteering the time to inspire our students and attendees. So I'll now hand over the session to our keynote panel host, Fenella Kernborn. Fenella is head of programming at Sydney Ideas and head of curation at TEDx Sydney. She has emceed, curated, and keynoted dozens of events and is familiar with the startup ecosystem from hosting Lumina, a podcast about how tech innovations challenge and shape the way we share stories. Fenella, we are thrilled to have you hosting this closing session of the Sydney Innovation Festival. Thank you very much, Martin, and I am absolutely thrilled to be here. Welcome to you as well. It is wonderful to have your company to consider some really big questions with some absolutely amazing guests. What is a startup and why should Australia make more? Seems kind of simple, but however, there's lots of things to think about and that's why we're going to talk about it today. And it's also really exciting that this is the final event for the Innovation Festival. So it's again, it's great to be here. So simple question, what is a startup? And why should Australia make more? The first part of the question might seem pretty easy, but exploring the current startup ecosystem within Australia and beyond, as well as the benefits that startups provide, it's going to take more time. Uh, so fortunately, as I said, we've got a great lineup of speakers for us who are going to be exploring the topic in great detail, and we're going to be hearing from you too and some of your questions. So thank you for making the time to join us today. Joining me, uh, we have our speakers. First up, we've got Lachlan Andrews, Global Communications Lead at Canva, who is joining us. Welcome to you, Lachlan. Also, we've got Lee Hatton, the Executive Vice President of Afterpay, and Amy Glancy, Chief of Staff at Atlassian. 
thank you all for joining us. Hi, how are you all? Good to see you. Hello. So, so good. Hi. hi. So many questions to get through today. So uh, again, if you've got a question for the panel, honestly, we've got Afterpay, we've got Atlassian, we've got Canva, perfect panel to ask your questions. So do use the, the, the Q&A function for that. But let's get started. We're going to ask a, a couple of opening questions just to get the kind of the opening gambits and, and thoughts from each of our speakers. Mm -hmm. So uh, Lee, if you don't mind, I might, I might start with you and with your perspective. So yeah, sure. You're... I just realized I wasn't on mute. Sorry about that. <laughs> Hope everyone enjoyed my cough. It was good. It's, a good, it's a good startup um, beginning. It's a good way to start <laughs> up. There we go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. So your background is as a non-executive director of Zero and also an executive yeah. Vice President of Afterpay. Mm -hmm. So let's start here. How would you define a startup in the Australian context? Yeah, so it was kind of cool when I was reading that because I was thinking, hey, like little known fact now maybe is that Zero is actually a Kiwi startup. So you're going to hear that in my accent a lot. But um, as you kind of think, as I kind of reflect on startups, I mean, I kind of grew up um, seeing Zero, you know, kind of start and I think a massive part of, you know, this whole mindset of Australia is, um, and New Zealand is like this whole number eight wire piece. Like, how do you make something out of nothing, right? Like, and I think um, for the startup community, it's so global now, right? And so I think it's really this sense of having an idea and kind of taking it to, like the common language is like a minimum viable product, but it's actually just having that mindset where you're in a culture, this is what's important for Australia, where you're willing to take a risk um, and give it a nudge and give it a go to get something to fruition. Um, I think the add-on to this whole kind of startup world though now is as humans, we're taking more a sense of purpose, right? Like as history would have it, you know, startups were kind of created to um, kind of provide an income or provide a future. Whereas now I think we're actually just more willing to take a risk and give things a go um, and have a mindset that says, how do we make a dent on the world in a purposeful way uh, rather than how do I make a difference for me? Um, so yeah, there, there's a few ideas to kick us off. Okay, I think that sounds great and some really good things to kind of think about. And I'd love to kind of think about also in, in more detail with each of you what a mindset might actually look like. Um, but um, Lachlan, I might move to you. Uh, you've worked with one of Australia's most successful startups, Canva. Uh, tell us a bit about the culture. How would you describe the culture within startups from an employee perspective? What does that look like for you? Yeah, it's certainly very exciting. I think we could almost have an entire panel dedicated to just what culture within a startup looks like. I joined Camo about two years ago now when we were probably closer to around 600 employees globally. We're now just over 2,000. So sort of watching that growth from the inside has been both incredibly exciting and also incredibly inspiring just to see how quickly we're able to grow and take on some of those challenges, I think in terms of being on the inside of that environment, the number of opportunities that really come with that growth are you know, incredibly exciting for people that are taking on challenges that we've never done before. We talk quite a lot at Canva about this constant gap between our hyper growth as a company and our own sort of knowledge and experience internally and needing to plug that gap as we grow. So I think there's really unlimited opportunities to be constantly upskilling if I was to sort of summarize what that culture looks like, I think um, you, know, you could certainly gain five years of traditional experience in just one year at a startup purely at the rate that things move. So it's been incredibly exciting to, to be a part of it. Mm. So you talked a bit about the rate that things have moved and the increase from 600 to 2000 employees in, in just a couple of years. Well, I mean, just briefly, I mean, we've talked about culture. What is culture like at Canva? Describe what it's like for you from a, from a day to day, being part of a startup that started small, but now is obviously quite big and global. Yeah, I think as an organization, we're incredibly values driven. I think that's a really common thread with a lot of startups to really set those core values as early on as you can and to have those as so much more than writing on the wall. And for us, those are really the guiding principles behind the work that we do. So one of our values is to set crazy big goals and make them happen. And I think that really speaks to the culture internally around being a really goals-driven organization and setting those seasonal goals across every single team. I think 
we've got probably more than 600 small teams within Canva now that sort of operate as their own little startups and chase these crazy goals over a three month period. So it's sort of this constant cycle of setting those huge goals and then really living out those values as well. So another one of our values is to be a force for good. And we're doing a lot of work in that space at the moment as well and making sure that the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis really connects back to those values, both in terms of the opportunity for people to constantly be upskilling and to really focus on delivering value to the community through hitting those goals. And then looking more widely at how can we give back to the ecosystem and encourage more startups in Australia as well. I love that. Um, Amy, great to have you here as, as well, listening to what Lachlan was just talking about and also following on from, from Lee's comments at, at the top there as well. It's like, how do we make a dent? values, culture, how does that play out for Atlassian? Uh, how important is that to the vision of Atlassian as well, just in consideration to what Lee's talking about and also Lachlan as well? Yeah, look, I think, um, you know, Lachlan said a common thread in, um, in tech companies is they're incredibly values driven and that, you know, technology was born in a really anti-establishment, anti-corporate culture way, you know, and that's, that was where you were, where the the refusal to wear the the corporate suit to work and to you know to do things in um in their own way is really born out of this um i guess refusal to conform to what professional life or corporate culture had told us that we had to you know do and act and behave um and you know some of the world's most famous um company values amazon for example um they're you know then they're, they're far more that sounds so cliche but they're far more than the poster on the wall like i just i hate saying that because it just sounds like such a throwaway line but it's so true um and culture is um incredibly important at atlassian as i'm sure it is at afterpay and canva um and we talk about our values you know, we're almost um, a 20 year old company now and the values were set, um, I think about three, three or four years in. Um, and I'll tell you a story because I think it's an interesting one as to how they were born. So um, Mike and Scott tell the story that, the that you know, when you when you're day one, when you're day 365, you're not really investing a lot of time in values. It's like, you know, the least of your worries. It's about getting the product out the door and hopefully getting some invoices in. Um, and they were still small enough at that point, you know, 10 employees, 20 employees, 30, 40 employees, where Mike and Scott were interviewing every single person who'd come in the door. And so just organically, the values that Mike and Scott had sort of co-created and never written down on paper, but there was like an understanding, were infused into all of the new hires because they hired them. And so they were sort of um, implicitly doing a values test without it being a really conscious, conscious thing in the interview process. And cut to, I think, it must have been around like 50 to 100 employees. And um, someone came to Scott and said, oh, like, I've got this person on my team and they're brilliant, but they're a complete jerk. And, like, I don't know how to fix the tension between these two things. Like, they're, you know, they're the A player. They're, they're you know, probably contributing like three or four times, maybe their peer. Um, and Scott said flat out, come back to me next week and tell me they're not a jerk or that they're not at the company. Um, and that is like, it's become such a, um, uh, such a sort of tribal story of Atlassian of, of, and it was such a, um, I guess it's such a sort of calcified um, moment of living the values. And so, and that gave permission for every other, you know, person and manager to thereafter think, okay, no, if, if Scott's not going to tolerate that, that gives me permission to not tolerate it as well. Um, and then there was, there was actually born needing to create values. And they did a really interesting exercise, which is called Mission to Mars. It's a, um, it was a Harvard Business Review exercise where you split in two teams and you have um, the management team as one group, and then you choose a bunch of um, sort of cultural torchbearers in the company. And you go away and you do separately and you say, if we were to take these cultural torchbearers and recreate Atlassian on a different planet, what values do they bring? Like, what do they bring with them? And they do this exercise um, in isolation of one another. And then you bring them back together and they were incredibly close. Like they were sort of 80% overlapping and they were born the Atlassian values and they, they've not changed in 16, 17 years. Does that resonate for you, Lee? Um, you sort of started off by talking about having a, a mindset, you know, how do we make a dent? We talked about culture with Lachlan, what Amy's talked about as, as well, but as Afterpay, also Zero, you started off with, does, that, does yeah, this resonate yeah, with yeah. you? Oh, no, absolutely. I was going to say to Amy, we used to have one um, in Zero, it was like, don't be a dick. 
Yeah. <laughs> I, and it was just, it, like just so simple. Right? Yeah. But I, it, like the reality is, I think it, as you're kind of growing up, you just kind of realize actually there's people that fit and there's people that don't and it's actually okay. Yeah. Um, and I think you don't kind of, in, in the nicest kind of way, not dissimilar to, you know, worried about your, what you're wearing you get you kind of you're not sweating the small stuff you don't have time right so it's like if you fit or you don't but let's just keep moving forward um and I think actually for a lot of um millennial and um gen z like it way more accustomed to actually wanting to find a place that you fit rather mm -hmm. than finding a place that it just doesn't feel authentic so I think um there's two things in that too in the startup world is like then who you surround yourself with um, you know, because obviously Alessia and the guys are really lucky to have each other as partners, you know, Canva partners, Afterpay partners, you know, Zero, um, you know, Rod had a partner early on. And I think, mm. you know, who you surround yourself with kind of sets you up as well um, for who your founding team is. Mm. Um, and those kind of, they're the most critical decisions that you make. Um, I love it. Going. Yeah, I mean, I love that we've started off this conversation, what is a startup, why should Australia have more, by thinking about culture and about your core values as well. So a really great way to kick off. Another question for you, though, Amy, because um, we've got so many questions to get through and also we're looking forward to yours as well. Um, but for the past two years, um, we've been through this thing called a global pandemic. Um, I suppose we're all across that right now. Um, but it's also shown that we've all been able to work at home or if we're able to in a way potentially before that we never thought we could do mm. um, so quickly. Uh, and Atlassian has now announced that it is a 100% distributed company. Mm -hmm. um, and we're now seeing more and more companies following this lead. So tell me a little bit about how COVID uh, has affected the Australian uh, tech ecosystem. Yeah, sure. Um, look, it's been wild, right? We've been on this almost two year um, global experiment that, you know, unprecedented, first of its kind. We all know the one-liners that started in, you know, in every ad that dropped, um, you know, in months after um, we, we first went into lockdown. Um, at, least, at least pivot stopped being used so much. Which is that's right. It wasn't pivot. Pivot was the word of 2020. 20. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Let's pivot team. Um, we're definitely, um, we're definitely criminals of that. Um, but yeah, we look, you know, we've seen like a decade's worth of transformation in, in, well, we're now almost two years in, right. But really that transformation happened in like six months, eight months. Um, and, you know, if you really think about it, you, you can, you know, probably too, too binary of a statement, but you can, you can pretty confidently say that tech has buoyed um, a very large uh, portion of that transformation. And, you know, Zoom has become a household name. The Queen uses it. Um, you know, key, our QR codes have had the comeback of all comebacks. I mean, no one used a QR code. Like it was, you know, it was the most... Um, it's daggy. a monster pivot. That's it's right. A monster, <laughs> pivot. A monster pivot, yeah, a you're monster right. monster pivot. And now QR codes are back and, you know, it's this like habitual thing, phone out, scan, walk into a premise. And, you know, that's all technology that technology facilitated really intelligent, um, uh, what do we call it, um, tracing, tracing and the, the data analysis. Um, and so the flip side of that is you say, wow, what a, what a moment to shine for tech, right? Like what an industry to be in. And if you want to be on a rocket ship and have all of the opportunities ahead of you, it's in technology. Um, and so, you know, Atlassian, um, if we just just um, pivot to Atlassian for a second and how we experience the, um, the pandemic, we made the decision um, really early on to, um, to decide that we were going to announce that we would be a hundred percent remote company or distributed is actually the word that we use um, because we will maintain having our offices. We're building a big office in Sydney, um, you know, at Tech Central, which is amazing. Um, but that that was really hinged on two things, two beliefs. One was, um, or one is, that we believe that accessing global talent is a huge competitive advantage. We can look quite literally now hire from anywhere in the world. Um, and to be able to access pockets of talent outside of the really highly saturated areas like Silicon Valley, um, we've got a huge office in um, in uh, Bangalore in India, but that's there's a huge market there. Um, we really deeply believe that that's a competitive advantage for us. We're in, we all know we're in a war for talent and how hard it is to get A players. Um, so that's one. And two is that we know people, i.e., that you know the, the the employees the everyone on this screen 
um, really want flexibility. Like gone are the days now that we feel like we have to sit in hours of peak hour traffic to get into an office to sit next to the person that you're probably sharing and collaborating in a document in real time anyway. And we were very quick to, um, to realize that work can be done as effectively asynchronously. So, you know, we don't need to be um, together in a room working on something. I can work on it on my time zone. I can throw it over the pond to US folks. They can work on their time zone and vice versa. The great thing about it, you just frozen there for a second, Amy, so I'll get you to turn your video on and off again. But oh, I mean, it's the great Sorry. thing. But, but, but just taking on your point there, I mean, uh, you know, it's true across, across many different organizations from startups and beyond this capacity to be able to work in a new ecosystem where we are able to work remotely uh, and in real time. We were doing it before, but we're now able to do it um, successfully, which I think is really great. Lachlan, Lee, anything to add there at all? Yeah, I mean, I think we've seen this huge and also this really exciting shift in accessing more talent. I think it's going to play a huge role in, you know, why should Australia create more startups in that, you know, we have really disproven the notion of collaboration needing to be done in one way or in one place. And we've built quite a similar model at, at Canva with sort of setting the expectation of having people back in the office once per quarter for you know the opportunity to connect in person for big company events but i mean other than that we've seen over the last 18 months that we've been able to you know not only work through the pandemic but also grow through that period and i think being able to have that balance between running errands and having your personal life outside of work and being able to work you know the hours that suit you i think it's a shift that we sort of saw the tech community start around flexible working hours and something that it's been really exciting to see other organizations adopting as well. Something that hopefully we'll see continue along post pandemic. For sure. Lee, well, anything well, else to add? Lee, uh, yeah, I was just going to say, what, what are your each pr prospective companies um, considering doing looking forward? For Canva, we are sort of keeping the very hybrid model with the guidance that we would like people to return to their nearest hub office once a quarter. So. Mm -hmm. That'll be for all the opportunity to sort of come together for big team planning events. But other than that, uh, we're keeping the guidance that you can work remotely and flexibly. Mm. Yeah, That's absolutely. Good. And I think it just, it's team by team, right? So depending on where you're at with what you're doing at any particular time, I think, you know, also too, I mean, we have a, a massive sales culture, obviously with retail and e-commerce and they, they are natural people that love to get together and have a drink and chat. And so you really just want to provide an environment for people that they love coming to do their best work in. Mm. Um, and I reckon that's the trick, right? Like it's in all of this flexibility. How do you... Um, how do you make sure people feel like intrinsically motivated, which can be really, really challenging for the, for the most highly motivated people. Mm -hmm. But how, how do you keep that um, energy going um, during these times when there, there is this massive flexibility, there is this other um, kind of pressure? Because I think, you know, as much as we get flexibility, we also get increased burden because it's like shit we don't have any excuse to not be everything now right <laughs> so you know I'm at home teaching my kids like I like you can be everything to everyone now and it's like whoa hold on we probably need to make sure we've got some boundaries um at the same time I think the cool thing though is that it I, I don't know about you guys I'm sure you're doing this too but you're kind of crazy if you've wasted COVID to not think about what your side hustle would be because like we've all got sick of watching we were talking about this before Netflix and Stan and every other fucking channel so you can't help yourself you start to think oh my gosh like what could I build you know like, oh what could be my so I think that's kind of been a really really cool thing out of it too well I'm not in a startup and I work at the university but I've just got a puppy so that's that's my side hustle now it's working <laughs> working working that one out see and but I really reckon late at night don't you want to design dog clothes or something like aren't you thinking a hundred percent no but that's okay <laughs> other people are doing it better than me but listen look this is a really great way to uh, start this conversation what is a st startup should Australia have more we've talked about culture so there's the culture of how you treat each other don't be a knucklehead to sort of quote you Lee but in a more polite way um you know 
then then there's that part of the culture, but then there's maintaining the culture for your employees in, as we work through the pandemic and of course, looking to the future. It's quite fascinating, but um, let's move on to, because there's lots of questions that are coming through by the way on the chat um, channel. So thanks for that. Um, and we sort of define what a startup is from different perspectives, but the impact that um, startups have had on Australian society, social impact uh, to employment. So maybe let's let's go here with Lee uh, right now. One, both of the main startups that you're involved with, they're both listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. Um, what were some of the implications to listing within Australia rather than externally, um, such as in the United States? Yeah, so I reckon the decision matrix that you kind of go through this, recognizing that, you know, zero, we started on the NZX, right? So zero started on the NZX. You kind of you get to a point where you're just growing up and all the investors know you. Like it, it's not it's not necessarily the best path to go listing early, right? Like everyone will do it for different reasons. But I think you kind of you kind of want to check that box for yourself right do I want to list is probably the first question and then where do I want to list would be the second um and so if we just kind of take the zero example yeah we started in New Zealand then we dual listed for Australia and most of that is kind of two things right like you want to follow your customers and your dominant markets right because you want to be relevant to actually the culture and the environment in which you're participating um, and then you want access to capital right and so the reality is you know the New Zealand market it's pretty illiquid you know like you want to get a lot of offshore investors you want to be really careful about who you've got on your registry um, and so coming into Australia obviously opens much wider pockets and wider groups a lot more um, international investors that have portfolios that they're able to invest more over here um, and then I think the question on US or um, London Stock Exchange, like I think it really comes back into how you want to manage your capital um, and how you want to manage your business. So they're intricate uh, and, you know, they all have pros and cons. Mm. What, what about from Atlassian's point of view, just following up um, from that, talk, talk, a bit, talk us a bit about the, the listing for Atlassian, Amy, the differences there. Yeah, so um, we get asked um, and, and criticised, um, you could say, uh, often about, um, you know, why we chose to list uh, on the NASDAQ and not in Australia. And um, really at the time it was about just access to global equity um, and in terms of um, where the deepest pockets were um, and that was most certainly um, not in Australia at the time. Now Australia's um, entire ecosystem and landscape has come a long way since Atlassian was born and let alone um, uh, IPO'd more recently. Um, but I think Lee had a really good point around you follow or you you, you really pull towards where your customers are and where the density of your um, of where your operations and market are. And that's for us in the US. Um, mm. Yeah. So you've got to go where the customers are and where and where the, the story is, I suppose, at the time. So it's 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 not just I'm going to do this because I can. It's making sure that it's the right moment for the startup, for the company, and making all the right decisions. It's as simple as that. Lee, would that be would that be right? Yeah, it's such a massive part of your narrative, yeah. right? And like Amy said, like we in zero, we like it was tall poppy syndrome for New Zealand, right? Mm -hmm. Like we we went nuts, and then when we took off the dual listing and came to Australia, you'd think we'd kind of shot someone. Like it was just so, so damning. But yeah. I think like you have to go through, again, coming back to this mindset and culture of each of the countries, like if you love something, set it free, right? Like you, you can't, you cannot hold these companies to these countries, right? Like we have to be global to be global. Yes. Um, and so I think it's a real philosophical shift actually for not just mum and dad investors, because they love it, right? That they, they love investing in another company that's growing um, from grassroots, but I think also too for in, in stows, you know, they can they can really see the power of the talent in Australia and New Zealand. I keep giving my little New Zealand plug here, but Australia and New Zealand. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that kind of talent, you know, you want to put money into. So yeah. it's pretty awesome. It, it makes I think it gets, it, it also, it gets tangled in a, in a conversation or a rhetoric of, um, like of patriotism versus like, it's a very business based yeah. decision and like Australia, you know, Australia versus the US, like clearly the market potential and the opportunity on some of the global um, markets is greater than um, the ASX. Now that's not to say, ASX isn't a, is, isn't a fertile ground um, and, you know, 
Afterpay and it's done tremendously well. Yeah. Um, I mean, Afterpay's um, IPO story is wild. Like, I, I think it's <laughs> maybe worth even sharing for a bunch of folks who might not know it, but it's like crazy insane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go on. Tell, tell us what happened. Because well, I think, I think, and very, very briefly, because I want to talk a bit about social impacts in a second. So go there quickly, Lee. Yeah. Well, no, no, it's just more. It was more just a story out of necessity. Is that what you were referring to, Amy? It was. It was just a story of necessity. And just right? the time. Like, just the timeline. Like yeah, so fast. Like yeah, we are very limited customers. I mean, zero is the same thing. Zero had less than a hundred customers, and actually, everyone on the register had maybe friends or family of the founder. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it started. Let, let's talk a bit about social impact. We've talked about talked about listing. So we, you know, the culture of a startup. What is a startup, of course, and and you know maybe the, you know the potentials of listing on a startup. And we've talked about culture, but and social impact too. And I, and it's very briefly, um, Lachlan. I know, and I know that um, Amy and Lee, uh, the founders, also do this. But Lachlan, tell me a bit about why Canva is um, so passionate about donating some of the wealth that they have towards charitable causes. Uh, how does this, I know we've talked about culture before, but how does this translate into culture across Canva? Tell me how that works. Yeah, Melanie, our CEO, she talks a lot about this simple two-step plan that we've got as a company. The first step being to build one of the most valuable companies in the world, which we are really fortunate to be making great progress towards. And the second, and what really we feel is the most important is to do the most good that we can as well. And it's interesting. And you know, we've had a lot of conversations with different people about these steps and sort of whether they should be done sequentially versus doing them at the same time. The way that we really see it is that step one can actually fuel step two and that what's good for business can be good for the world. And I think that really speaks as well to why you know, Australia does need more startups. Amy touched earlier on the pandemic as an example of seeing you know, tech and innovation really taking a leading position on being able to give back to the community and being able to help. I think it's incredibly inspiring to see the ways that the Australian tech community were able to get behind the bushfires, the way that we were able to provide emergency relief to other countries throughout the pandemic and to have really both the resources and the talent internally to take on these problems as, as a collective as well. And I think it's been really exciting to, you know, to work with other tech companies as well and to put our heads together around how can we solve some of these problems around the world. For us mm -hmm. internally, it, it's a huge part of our mission. And to sort of be a force for good is one of Canva's core values. And uh, as Mel and Cliff announced recently, Putting 30% of the company towards social good means that everybody at Canva plays a part in that. Whether you're shipping a new feature or you're writing a press release or you're helping in customer support, the work that everybody does to increase the value of the entire company then increases that pool of money that we've got to really deploy towards doing good things around the world. So we've just kicked off a pilot program in, um, in Africa sort of looking at how we can help solve poverty as one of the first issues there. And really excited to get some of the learnings back from that and scale the work that we're doing. And then on the product side, uh, you know, sort of social impact and being a force for good informs a lot of the work we do around our nonprofit program and giving Canva's premium version away to more than 100,000 nonprofits. And now also really investing in education and giving it away to school districts and looking at really equipping students and teachers with those skills to develop you know, digital literacy, particularly throughout the pandemic. So yeah, it certainly translates to our culture. I think it's what inspires everybody at Camo to really hear the stories about the way that people are using the product and to see the tangible impact we're able to have on the world will be you know, far more inspiring than any valuation that we're able to achieve. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I love this. And I mean, Atlassian is, is kind of the same, you know, uh, sort of part of the sort of the DNA, I guess, of, of the, the company in terms of social impact. I remember, um, uh, you know, the, the in fact, you were part of this, weren't you, Amy, lighting up the Sydney, um, you know, headquarters with a big massive rainbow and supporting yeah. same-sex marriage. Thank you very much. I'm now allowed yeah. to do it. Excellent. Um, yeah. You know, so <laughs> um, tell me a bit about some of the social impact achievements that Atlassian has implemented since um, you've been... Spending yeah, yeah. some time there. Any new initiatives as well? Yeah, look, we're um we're loud supporters of um of uh or loud um let's call it agitators around climate change. Um that's would be no news to anyone. Mike was all over the AFRI 
um, this week and we were actually trying to wrangle um, a team together to get to uh, COP26, which is in Glasgow at the end of the month, but we just couldn't quite pull it off with um, COVID and restrictions and flights. And so we'll try to make as much noise as we can from, um, from down under. But um, look, it goes back to, you know, the, one of the first things I said, which is Atlassian's always been a values-led company. Um, if you, you know, if you build your company um, socially conscious, human, it's very hard to, to ignore, uh, ignore the reality that you're a global citizen, ignore the reality that you're part of a community and part of a fabric, you know, the, like the days of the role of the, of the, the business is to make money and, and, and make money for itself and its shareholders, you know, that's not, that's not good enough anymore. And I would say it's an obligation of every company, no matter how big you are, um, to be able to give back in some sense or to at least if you have if you have no means to give back at least stand up for what you believe in and what your mm. um and what your employees believe in and, and really be proud of being able to do that and that's something that Atlassian was always really lent into um the same-sex marriage lights was one um yeah amazing thing that we did like that that one was very close to my heart um I was a big um I was in the comms role at the time and sort of I just came up with this idea and I wanted to do it and I went to Mike and Scott and they didn't really know what I meant at first I think and I sort of just said trust me and then I went and figured out how to get lights up on a big old building which you know originally I was like oh we'll just you know like vivid there's full of lights you just go and get laser technology and I'm sure it'll be really easy it wasn't at all and and laser technology is really expensive just um hint for anyone who's got any ideas so I actually just like side side story because I think it's worth the the chuckle I had to go and find um, this one supplier who had projected lights um, uh, onto a city of Sydney building before in town hall who didn't use laser lights and has literally like a three or four ton, like huge, think of it as like the size of a building projector, like, um, yeah, like projector, like it, like, you know, like where you put the little film things in. And so we had to print films and it was this like huge steel thing that we had to put on top of a rooftop over the other side of the building. We didn't get any city permits. Like I was like, oh my God, like I'm going to get sued or something for not getting a street permit. And then I thought, well, actually Clover, as I'm feeling, is not going to have an issue with this. So like push on. Um, and we did it all without telling any of our staff. So we surprised everyone and we woke up the next day and we had a blog and it was all in the media and the response from all of our staff, but particularly our um, LGBTQI community was just made the um blood sweat and tears like worth it to put to start mm. off with um when I was thinking in my darkest moments this thing's never going to be pulled off um but it happened but it happened, but it happened. and it was just like it was just amazing you know it was That's like great. it was so amazing to be it's part a, it's, of but it's a really um, good a special. Um, it's and it look it's great and it's really good to know that you know even when something gets really really big even when you as the head of comms are in a really big role you can still get involved with social impact and things like that which is fantastic um we've got so many questions to get through and i know there's been questions that have come through on the chat channel so wow. thanks again um we've got a couple of video questions so uh let's let's go to our very first video question and nick is going to share the screen and we're going to hear a video question from susme which is the sydney university society of medical innovation let's have a listen hi everyone we are the sydney university society of medical innovation or better known as SESME. Our question today is for the Chief of Staff at Atlassian, Amy Glancy. Innovation is typically seen as a high-risk activity with a significant chance of failure and big stakes. In the media, we usually also see innovation being carried out by large companies or older experienced individuals. Considering these points, would you still recommend young students to pursue innovation through startups? And why? Okay. So do you need me to read the question out to you again? Or you um, no, no, I think I got it. Um, what, a, what, a, what a thoughtful stitched together question. Everyone had yeah. an equal share of voice there. I appreciate that. Um, like a good startup. Exactly like a good startup. Um, look, I think I disagree with the premise of that question. So I, that, that, that question to me um, infers that failure is a bad thing. Um, and I think that's, largely I think how we're raised that's what the school our education systems um, tell us you know you fail exam that's a bad thing and then you actually realize that that's not true and that's not how the world works and um, you know politicians particularly set a set a standard of you can never be wrong you can never get 
you know, anything slightly incorrect. You could never concede that you were wrong on anything. Um, and then you get into the real world and you start working and you realise, oh, fuck, you fail like kind of every day in little bits. Um, and there's a saying, there's a, you know, an adage that's fail, um, fail often, fail fast. And then actually Elon Musk iterated it famously when he said fail fast, fail early, fail often. And what that's really saying is, um, you know, it's the, the learning, the, the amazing learnings that you get that you don't just, um, that aren't just iterative every day of like confirmation bias are in your missteps, are in the failures. And I think in Australia, it's a bit of a dirty word, but certainly in um, Silicon Valley and like much more established um, tech precincts, it, failure, particularly a, a, a failed startup is almost like a badge of honor. It's like, you gave it a crack, you got some investment, you learn a bunch you probably spun off a whole bunch of smart people and then you then you maybe went off and did something else and, and presumably it was better because you had a whole bunch of baggage behind you that you were able to learn and iterate from. So, yeah, look, I would say, you know, at, at Atlassian, it's, you know, we talk about failure all the time, failure learnings. It's just, it's all part of it. It's encouraged. Mm, it's all, it's exactly. And it's the same if you're an architect or a designer, they often talk about, you know, failure is a good thing because you're actually iterating. Maybe right. rather than failure, you're iterating. Uh, Lee, did you want to add anything to that before we move on to our next uh, next question? Yeah, I, I just agree. You know, like <laughs> you got you got to give things a go. I, I think the, the challenge is, oh, actually, Jesus, I haven't used a Ted Lasso thing in a wee while. Oh, here we go. But, um, I think the cool <laughs> thing with failure is like be a goldfish right yes. like it, <laughs> yeah. because it's real it's hard like it is so hard to get over um yeah. but yeah that whole be a goldfish piece is so critical because you know you got to learn some stuff but actually just keep moving forward yeah, uh, i think the other don't piece dwell that, on it nah don't dwell and it, the other thing is too um know your narrative right because even when you fail you can market it like a success so be really smart about how you talk about it because failure can sound like failure bomb bomb yeah. or it can be like bomb bomb like whoa yeah. so just go careful on yeah. on that little piece like some it. of some it. of the world like amazon one of the most successful companies in the world is famous for its failures like the fire yeah. phone that I'm sure no one on this phone uh, over on call even knows about because it was a massive flop. Um, but they write about it. They're lauded for what they learnt about it. Um, yeah, it's not at all seen as this dirty thing. Bump, bump, as Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> bump, bump. Okay. Let's